This is a modern recreation of the romantic robot Multiface 128. This tool of pirates and cheats has been reverse engineered by Stephen Smith and we're going to build it right now. Mark fixes stuff. This video is sponsored by PCBWay. You can get an instant quote on a variety of services or browse a library of talented makers designs, add them to your cart and have them delivered directly to your door. So this is the Multiface 128 a device by Romantic Robot that allows you to peek inside code, poke cheats and dump the contents of memory to a storage device. Yo ho me hearties. It requires a stonking 10 74 series logic chips. They're all common and inexpensive parts though. A 27C64 EEPROM and a 64K CMOS SRAM chip. We'll need 12 100 nanofarad capacitors just ceramic, not tantalum. These are not the right lead spacing, so we'll need a little bit of persuasion to fit. Oops. A single board mounted tactile momentary switch. And a couple of standard 1 kilo ohm carbon film resistors. We'll be using sockets for the chips so we'll need two larger 28 pin dip sockets for the EEPROM and SRAM. And 10 14 pin dip sockets for the 74 series logic chips. That's a lot of pins to solder, eek. And speaking of pins, there's a whole rake more to be soldered on this custom Sinclair Spectrum Edge connector. You can make your own as we have on this channel, but this one was bought ready prepared from thefuturewas8bit.com. So let's start work. As always, the first thing to do is to clean down the board with IPA to remove any fingerprints or contaminants that might cause problems soldering. This is especially important today because I'm trying a new reel of solder. I hope it's decent. So starting with the components closest to the board, we'll install the 100 nanofarad capacitors first. These don't fit. The pitch of the leads going into the component are correct, but the mounting leads are widened. This was a mistake on my part when I checked what I had in the parts bin. So to save reordering, I'm simply straightening the legs. Not really good practice, but it will save us time waiting around for a delivery. Capacitors C1 to C12 are for decoupling and were not actually present in the original Multiface 128. Stephen added them to his re-engineered design as good practice. With the leads all straightened, the capacitors slip into the board quite nicely. You'd never know I messed up. The eagle-eyed amongst you will notice that I'm making sure the markings are all facing the same way. This isn't required, it's just that I'm a bit weird. And they don't look too bad considering I mess up. Flipping the board over they should all stay in position. And it's time to fire up the soldering iron to our usual 330 degrees Celsius. Once the iron is up to temperature, we can start to solder the capacitors into place. I start off by trying my new solder reel. And it's not great. So for a sanity check, I switched to my tried and trusted Weller radio lot, even though it's way too thick for this job. The radio lot works great, so I know that it's not the components or the board. So with my eye in, I decide to try the new solder again. It's meant to be a 6337 alloy with a rosin flux core, 
but in reality it's an awful clumpy mess. Even additional flux doesn't help. Don't buy this solder, it's rubbish. I flooded the messy joints with a few blobs of decent Weller solder so that I could clean them up. Once they were flooded, I sucked the excess away. With that drama over, it's time for a snipping session. The decoupling capacitors are all installed now and not looking too bad, all things considered. Let's deal with the resistors next. Just bend the leads roughly into shape, pop them through the board and bend the leads again to make sure the resistor won't fall out when we invert the PCB. A quick solder and a snip and the resistors are all in place. Let's get the top row of DIP14 sockets installed. Instead of Smurf poop, we're going to use a bit of Captain tape to hold the sockets in place. We only need to do either end of the sockets and we can remove the tape again. Oh, nice and tight. As I solder the ends in, you can see that I'm touching the polyamide tape with the iron. The tape is unaffected by the temperature of the soldering iron, which is why it's great for jobs like this and masking off areas of PCBs when you're using hot air desoldering and resoldering. The real name brand is Capton with a K, but there are lots of supplies of polyamide tape now. This one is called Captoon. Okay, enough chat, let's speed things up. After removing the tape, I just have one gazillion pins left to solder. Time for a bit of flux to speed things along. I've also switched to a thinner gauge Loctite branded 6040 solder. Having the right gauge or thickness of solder to match the parts you're working on really makes life easier. I generally switch between 0.8mm and 1.2mm thicknesses with the thicker stuff coming in handy for big jobs like RF shielding. Nearly missed this row, it's easy to miss pins or even entire swathes of pins like this when you have so many to do, so always check your work. And we need another two DIP14 sockets here. We'll use our polyamide tape again. Whilst we're on the subject, polyamide tape is a really strong dielectric or electrical insulator. It's handy for a quick layer of insulation between circuits and metal shielding. You'll often find it as the coating on magnet wire or trace repair wire. Pursuit mode kit. And with all the DIP14 sockets installed, it's time to put in those larger DIP28 sockets. I'm not going to lie to you and say that these are top quality sockets. 
They're from a multi-pack I bought on Amazon for about £7, but I'm on a really tight budget here at Mark Faces Stuff. As such, the legs are quite thin, and it can mean a short straightening session before they pop into the board. This time, instead of tape or blue tack, we're going to flick the opposing corner pins on the underside of the sockets. It's not my favourite technique because the sockets can still slip and end up uneven, but it's worth showing you this alternative way of working. To fit this other socket, we need to rotate the board. That's number wang! It's really coming together now. Looks like the gummy crew have been on the IPA and uh, not the cleaning variety. A bit more no clean flux. More on no clean fluxes in a moment. A bit of speedy soldering now. Flux really helps solder the socket pins with the minimum of effort. But look at the icky sticky mess that that no clean flux leaves behind. Next up, that tactile switch. These have a rectangular lead spacing and can only be installed the right way around. Soldering them into position is simple, but be sure to create a nice thick joint to resist any mechanical movement. Finally, that ZX Spectrum edge connector. Thanks guys. After all this soldering on the front side of the PCB, you might be tempted to solder the edge connector on the same side but it needs to be inserted into the rear. This time, let's use that fan favourite, the blue goo, the schlumpf scheisse, the smurf poop. We'll just do the pins at either end. Then remove the Mörd de Strumpf and solder in the rest of the connector. I hope you're enjoying this video and find it useful and informative. This channel is supported by my wonderful patrons and I'm chasing my dream to become a full-time content creator making more videos like this for you. If you're able to and would like to help by becoming a patron, please visit patreon.com forward slash markfixesstuff for details of Patreon perks and benefits. With the edge connector installed, it's time to install the silicon. But first, just look at the state of the board, and this is residue from the no clean flux. We'll clean it with IPA, but why is it called no clean if it needs cleaning? Well, fluxes contain acids. No clean just means that after use, the acid is burned away enough that it won't corrode the board. Stronger fluxes must be cleaned or the workpiece will be affected over time. In real terms, it's just telling you that the flux becomes inert after use. It's certainly not telling you that it's presentable. Let's program that EEPROM. We'll be using my Mini Pro TL866 clone and one of the fake ST EEPROMs from AliExpress. We figured out that these were NSC Fairchild parts, remarked by an unscrupulous seller in our previous video. 
we'll insert our part in the right position, then flip over to the PC. So this is the part number that's marked on the chip. It's wrong and using it will cause the program to throw up an error. By googling the return part code of 8FC2, we found out that these are a skimmed and remarked national semiconductor part, but are the right capacity and byte organisation. By the way, NSC and Fairchild merged years ago, so share many of the same part codes, and either selection will work. With the right part selected, a blank check throws up no errors and shows that the EEPROM is empty and ready to be programmed. Now we can load the ROM file into the buffer of the program, ready to write to the EEPROM. I'll add a link to the file below so you can easily find the same version that I've used. File load options are the usual defaults, binary type to code memory and click OK. Scrolling the ASCII in the buffer we can see some human readable text that shows we've got the right file. Now we just press the P button to write the file to the EEPROM itself. By default it will verify the data written to the EEPROM against the data stored in the buffer. And the programming was a success. EEPROMs are erased using a strong UV light through this quartz window. We'll put an opaque sticker on this later to prevent that, but we'll test the device first. Next up is inserting the supporting 74 series logic into the board. The chip types and orientations are marked on the location, so it's nice and easy to follow on this PCB. Just make sure that the chips are firmly seated with no bent legs or pins missing the sockets. I might be starting to regret these cheap sockets at the moment. But eventually, the logic is all installed. We insert our newly programmed EEPROM. A point to note here is you must put the chip notches matching the socket notches and as they're marked on the silk screen. The texture orientation on the board could be a bit misleading. And with our SRAM chip installed, the board is finally complete. It's quite a weighty little number. Now whilst this isn't a usage guide, I think it's only fair to fire it up and check that it brings up the NMI menu and functions screen. There's plenty of instructions on the Multiface 128 on the internet and they're demonstrated far more competently than I ever could. Powering on the Spectrum 48K and pressing the NMI button brings up the Multiface 128 menu straight away. The menu responds to key presses and works great. I also tested it on a Spectrum 128K plus 2 grey. Note that the output connector on the later black case models was changed by Amstrad and means that this interface won't work on those later revisions. All in all, a successful build. I'd like to thank my amazing Patreon supporters who make this channel possible. Here they are on the screen. Thank you all.
Thanks for watching this video. Here's some more that I think you might enjoy. See you again soon. Bye.